Hello all, and uh, thank you very much for uh, attending our um, second webinar uh, in this uh, continuing education series for Medmont. I would like to uh, thank uh, Randy Kojima for being our host of this uh, webinar. I would also like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Ferguson. I am the new business development director for Medmont. I would also like to uh, thank our co-sponsors, uh, NIDAC USA, USA, iVinci in the Netherlands, Number 7 Contact Lenses in the UK, MedCornea from Russia, uh, Cooper Vision Soflex uh, from Israel, uh, Belgium Optical Supply from Belgium, ConLens from Denmark, and Velosa from Austria. Uh, over to you, Randy, and thank you very much for, again, for your time. I sincerely appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody, and welcome again to the session on What Eye Shape Tells Us About Contact Lenses. My name is Randy Kojima, and the goal today would be to talk about how we can use the Medmont topographer before we fit the contact lenses to appreciate which direction we should go in lens fits or what it the topographer in general tells us about the eye that can help us to be a little more efficient in contact lens practice. So the question is, how can the topographer help us with all of these various specialty contact lenses that we might fit? And, and the story is that it is an incredibly powerful tool that aids us with virtually any type of specialty contact lens or even conventional contact lenses like the, the big box brands. So let's get into that. Now, keratometry, we have to talk about. It's such an important piece of information. Of course, it gives us the radius of the eye. It gives us perspective on how steep or how flat the eye is. Um, it also provides us with a understanding of the corneal astigmatism. So K reading is our K readings are very important. Now, when we look at this patient, and we were to focus on the K readings, we see that this patient has very little corneal astigmatism, only less than a quarter diopter of difference between the flat and the steep meridian. And we look at the topography and we see this very uniform power within the pupil. So related to any kind of medium for correcting a patient's vision, of course, looking at this topography tells us that this eye should correct to a high level of visual acuity because we really have very little, let's call it action within the pupil. The eye has a very uniform and uh, arguably ideal shape to bend light. When we compare that to this patient, now we see a little more corneal astigmatism. We might expect some refractive cylinder coming through. But let's ask ourselves the question, can we expect this patient to see well with glasses, with soft lenses, with rigid lenses? And of course, the answer is yes, with such a symmetric eye shape, we could cut this eye in half and the superior hemisphere is a mirror of the inferior, nasal a mirror of the temple. This eye is about as symmetric as it, as it comes, at least for an astigmatic eye. The flat meridian and the steep meridian are 90 degrees perpendicular from each other. So this means that spherocylinder refraction should correct this patient very, very easily to a high level of visual acuity. How about here? And of course, K readings tell us that we've got a fairly irregular eye. The flat K, very normal, 4362, or about 7.7 .7 millimeters in radius for those of you who think in mils, but the steep meridian, very high at, at almost 51 diopters. So clearly a steeper cornea, and the topography is saying the K readings are indicating a corneal astigmatism of seven and a quarter diopters. But of course, K readings are gonna struggle to measure this eye when we don't have a defined flat or steep meridian. We have a very irregular corneal shape and we can look at the powers distributed within this eye. We go from 63 and a half diopters here to 36 diopters down here. So that's about a 27 diopter differential in power from this point 
to this point. So related to contact lens fitting or even glasses, how would we expect to correct this eye to a high level of visual acuity? Of course, we're going to need some type of specialty contact lens, a corneal GP, a piggyback, a hybrid lens, a scleral lens, or something that is going to be able to mask this irregularity that we see within the pupil. So the topography can really give us some insight before we start. Which are the patients that have high potential for visual acuity? Which are the patients that have all kinds of options for us to correct their vision? Which are those that are going to require us to be a little more selective in what we choose to provide a high level of VA or the best corrected vision that may be possible? So K readings have value. They do tell us about the gross radius of the eye. In this case, we see all of these eyes are about 43 and a half diopters in flat axis uh, radius, but you get the sense where K readings kind of let us down a little bit when we're dealing with the irregular cornea. If we were looking at the flat radius of the eye only, Key readings are telling us all these eyes are the same, but as you can tell, all these eyes are very different. Now let's consider another point of reference to understand how steep or how flat the eye is. And that's the radius of the cornea at the center. So not the K readings at three millimeters out. Let's look at the central radii of the cornea. And this is also known as RO or R0, meaning radius at zero distance from the center. Now, this is kind of an important value because this is the point that is directly related to line of sight and the fixation point of the patient. So if this radius is steep or flat, that of course will affect how light is bent to the retina. So apical radius is a very, very important value related to a lot of different applications in contact lenses. So in this case, we might look at the most commonly used place that we would reference apical radius, and that's on a subtractive map. And as you know, a subtractive map is used in orthokeratology. It's used in monitoring refractive surgery patients. It's used in patients that were concerned about disease progression. What a subtractive map does is it compares a point in time to another point in time and tells you the difference. It subtracts A from B to give you C. So if you have steepening over time, that shows up as hot, as yellow or red or orange. If you have flattening between these two visits, then you have C blue. And in this case, we've done orthokeratology. We notice all the flattening within the pupil, very much centered to the black pupil margin. So I think we've done a good job of orthokeratology in terms of where the epithelium is flattening. The second thing is related to apical radius. If we click our cursor right on the center of the topography on the visual axis and compare the power of the eye before ortho K to the power of the eye after ortho K, there's a 2.57 diopter difference or about a two and a half diopter flattening. So I don't need to do a refraction on this patient. I just simply go to the axial subtracted map, compare before ortho K to after ortho K, the difference map will tell me how much change was at the fovea, how much change is on the visual axis. Now, what about soft lenses? Can this apical radii be used in some way with our soft contact lens fits? And absolutely it can. If you click your power right in the center of the topography, you can see what the radius was before you fit the soft lens, and you can compare that to after the soft lens wear. Now, this patient had a alteration in their overrefraction on the lens over a week, and we couldn't understand why. 
there was, this was an absolutely normal eye. The fit of the soft lens was ideal. The overfraction uh, on the dispensing visit was was right on. There'd be no reason for there to be any real changes after a week. But when we compared the pre-fit versus uh, post wear of the lens, this patient was showing a almost one diopter shift in their corneal power. So the contact lens was molding the eye shape. And we know that from various studies. The silicone hydrogels have a high modulus. In other words, they're very rigid. They're far more likely to mold the eye than HEMA soft lenses. So this is a way that we can understand, are the soft lenses that we fit, or even, the, of course, the rigid, are they altering eye shape over time? So the subtractive map allows you to compare one point in time to another point in time, and clicking on the apical radius tells you if you are likely to be ch uh, submitting changes to the, the power to the retina, and therefore, do you need a different contact lens power? Now, here's another case where we saw some changes over time due to our contact lens wear. And here's a patient that was wearing rigid lenses and had spectacle blur when they removed the contact lens. And as you know, a spectacle blur is when our contact lens wearers take their lenses off and their habitual or, or their correct glasses prescription just doesn't seem to work, suggesting that we may be altering the eye shape. And clearly, when we look at this topography, there's something amiss. This doesn't look like a normal, with the rule astigmatism, doesn't look like a normal shape eye. We've got this big smile down here. We've got this arc of flattening running right through the cornea, which isn't very typical of a normal disease-free non-surgical eye, which this was. Well, let's do a subtraction. And when we compare post-removal of the contact lens to allowing that lens to rehabilitate over a period of four days, we're beginning to see a figure eight hourglass astigmatism beginning to form. And when we go to the subtraction, you see how much action has happened in corneal change within that four days. Where we see this hotspot, that's where the eye is steepening up, where it's taking back its normal shape. We see this flattening here, where the contact lens was obviously creating steepening when it was on eye and molding that contact lens, or sorry, molding the cornea. So there's a lot of things that are returning back to equilibrium or back to normal shape. And this subtractive map is incredibly valuable. Imagine if you have a 18 year old patient that is showing some kind of inferior steepening. And you're wondering, is this a droopy cornea or is this a diseased eye that we should be following? Well, if we were to map the patient today, map the patient six months from now, do a subtraction, if we're seeing a hotspot popping up, we know that that eye is shifting. We know the eye is changing and therefore cross-linking may be called for. If we see a complete area of green showing you basically zero change between visits, it appears that cornea isn't altering in the least. And therefore, it's, it may not be likely that we need any form of cross-linking. It could be just a droopy cornea. So the topographies are incredibly valuable to us in, in so many ways. And, and one of those is simply to understand vision. It, if we look at this high corneal astigmat, we would expect because it's such regular astigmatism, this patient should do very well for vision. We can correct this patient with glasses, soft lenses, rigid lenses, anything. This patient is indicating to have some irregularity to the eye shape, the inferior hemisphere, not exactly a mirror of the superior. This patient may not achieve perfect quality of vision. 
this patient, of course, is going to have a very low best corrected visual acuity. So to understand that, you want to use the axial map, axial for vision. What else can we do with a corneal topographer that can help us with contact lenses? And all of these cases are good examples of where we should have done a better job of measuring the visible iris diameter before we started. If we would have, we, we would have done a better job of selecting the correct initial lens diameter. So topography is gives us such an easy value that is so helpful related to any of our contact lens fitting. Now, one of the considerations is what is the normal of visible iris diameter? And in North, this North American study, I know that if we went to South America, we would see a different average VA. If we went to Northern Europe versus Southern Europe, or if we went to Asia or Africa, we might see different visible iris diameters. But in North America, 300 consecutive uh, right eyes were measured, and the average visible iris was 11.8 millimeters. So if we say that normal VID is somewhere in this range of 11.5 to 12.1, then a good percentage of the population surely falls within the middle of the bell curve. But what's interesting is about one in four patients fall outside of that normal median range. So when you think about your specialty contact lens fitting, um, or even your regular contact lens fitting, how often are you choosing a custom diameter of lens for a patient? Does our lens diameter have anything to do with the significant dropout of uh, soft lens patients that we see every year? Now, of course, we know that dry eye is a huge factor with soft lens dropout, but diameter must factor in there some, somewhere. So that's something to think about with your contact lens fitting and especially your conventional soft lens fitting. As an example, would you fit a 14 millimeter lens on a 10 millimeter cornea? Would you take that same 14 millimeter diameter and put it on a 13 millimeter eye? We certainly wouldn't expect a lens that was designed for the 11 and a half, 11.8 millimeter cornea to work ideally on an incredibly small or incredibly large eye. So VID matters because, of course, the smaller the eye, the lower the sagittal depth. The larger the eye, the greater the sagittal depth is likely to be. Now, of course, we can have a small cornea that's incredibly steep it can have a high sagittal depth. We could have an incredibly large cornea that's really flat in radius, and that could be a median depth. But if we assume normal curvature and a 10 millimeter eye, that's going to be a very low sagittal depth. If we assume a median radius eye and a 13 millimeter visible iris diameter, we can assume that's a much deeper eye. So of course, we're going to need to modify how we fit those specific cases. Now, pupil size is another important value that I think we overlook, kind of like the visible iris diameter. When are we dealing with the incredibly small pupil? And if we're trying to fit a multifocal contact lens that has its add power at three or four millimeters, how are we going to provide that patient with multifocality when their pupil may only be two mils? Similarly, if we have a seven millimeter pupil and a small optic zone of lens, how are you going to avoid some kind of flare and glare or blur from the high order aberrations that we might create from that large pupil? Now that patient was going to need an incredibly big optic zone to be able to manage the aberrations that may be introduced to that eye. So pupil size matters, and on the Medmont, what it does is it marks the pupil with this gray border here so that you can see with the graph, when you take this axis line around, what are the powers that are distributed within the pupil? In this case, we see this eye goes from approximately 
58 diopters in here to somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 diopters right here. So that's a 18 diopter distribution of power. That's a severe amount of power that's distributed within the pupil. So this simple little thing under, to understand the kind of vision this patient may have is very valuable to us in any pre-fitting contact lens consideration. Now, what about myopia control? Does pupil size matter related to the application of orthokeratology lenses and trying to slow down eye growth? Here we use the subtractive map again, compare before ortho-K to after ortho-K and measure the difference. And what you're seeing, of course, is we have a beautiful bullseye. This is the ideal ortho-K outcome where the blue treatment zone is well centered to the pupil. When we click our cursor right on center, this patient had a 3.64 diopters myopic reduction. If this is a three and a quarter, three diopter myope, three and a half diopter myope, they're super happy with their vision right now. But is this a good myopia controlling outcome? What do you see in the topography that would indicate whether you've done a good or bad job of this topography? And that's where we might focus in on the pupil here, this dark gray area. You notice where it defines the surface area within the pupil. So what we do then is focus in on 0.0. .0. That's the center, that's the visual axis. And look for the pattern that follows from center to periphery. If this were LASIK surgery or some kind of refractive surgery, we would hope that we'd have this massive treatment zone. We'd have very little change from the most minus to the edge of the pupil border. We don't want a small treatment area. We want a huge treatment zone. In myopia control, it's the opposite. We want a tiny area of most minus. We want to lose that effect as quickly as possible so that we're pushing as much plus into the pupil. So let's compare the power on the visual axis to the power at the pupil margin, and it shows us that we lose about 3.62 diopters of our exchange. So from this point to this point, we create essentially a three and a quarter diopter add. Now, when you think about myopia control and what the experts are recommending to us, do they tell us in soft multifocal lenses to put a one add on the patient? The answer is absolutely not. Why would you push a tiny amount of plus? Push as much plus as possible to try to send the strongest signal to slow down eye growth. So in this case, we're pushing three over three and a half diopters of plus power. This is a very good myopia controlling outcome, or we would suspect that we have done the right job for myopia control. What about soft multifocal lenses? What can we understand about uh, the fitting of these presbyopic contact lenses? So here is a topography of the naked eye, no contact lens. Here's a topography of the patient with the lens on. So no lens compared to lens on eye. And here on the subtractive side, you see the powers that the pupil has created on the anterior surface. And what you might notice is the peak of the add or the peak of the plus is decentered almost a millimeter away from center. The most plus area of this near center multifocal is really decentered in relationship to the black pupil. Similarly, the minus power distance zone of the lens is also decentered. So our contact lens is not lining up with the line of sight. The optic axis is about a millimeter superior temporal of the visual axis. So this is something we're obviously not too happy about, and this might suggest why the patient isn't getting perfect near and distance vision. If we focus in on the pupil 
and understand this area within the dotted red line, notice the asymmetric distribution of power. So we have done a poor job of centering this contact lens on I, and it's no surprise that while we might have provided better multifocality, we've increased the aberrations to the point where it's neutralized or nullified the benefit of the multifocality that we've created. This patient probably has a fair amount of blur at all distances, near and far. What about the mapping over a scleral? We've just that, done that over a soft multifocal lens. What if we do topography over a scleral lens? Here's a, a case where the patient has a very well-fit lens. The physiologic response is negative for any slit lamp signs. The patient is incredibly comfortable, but we have an overfraction of plano minus 150 axis 90. So do we need a front toric scleral lens? Is, or is this internal astigmatism that's coming through? And when we do topography over top of our lens, we can see that the anterior surface is basically spherical. The K readings over the scleral lens on eye, so again, topography over the contact lens, is indicating to us we have virtually nil for corneal astigmatism. So this over refraction is interior, it's uh, the back surface of the cornea, it's the crystalline lens, it's something, but it's not on the contact lens itself. Our scleral lens is not warping. So it gives you some idea of what you should do next. We need to fit this patient with a front toric scleral lens. We don't need a thicker lens. That won't reduce the flexing because there isn't any flexing. It's all internal. Now, we talked a little bit about pupil, and one of the things that we often do with our presbyopes especially is to do topography with the lights on and see a more photopic pupil. We do topography with the lights off to see a more scotopic pupil. And that way, we have a bit of understanding of how much shift do we have in the size of the pupil, and therefore, what might we worry about related to the optics of our contact lens. So that's one simple thing that you might consider. Well, let's talk about a case. And here is a very regular corneal astigmatism. You see the flat meridian, 90 degrees perpendicular from the steep meridian. We see an eye that is a mere top and bottom, nasal and temporal, a very symmetric eye. We do have an incredibly high corneal astigmatism, but again, we have a regular corneal astigmat. So the axial map tells us about vision, tells us this patient should do very well in a glasses prescription, should do very well in a soft multifocal, sorry, a soft toric lens that might stay on axis. When we switch over to the tangential map, we understand a little bit about eye shape. Is the cap of the cornea decentered in any way? Do you see the contours of these colors pulled one direction or the other? Is there any um, um, severe change in the curvature of the eye? Here is where you're noticing the red. Is that due to lid force, that constant lid force on the edge of the cornea that's causing the steepening of curvature? Those are the things that we look at in the tangential map. It's very sensitive to where there is shape change on the eye. So the axial map tells us about power. The tangential map tells us about shape. But which of these maps would tell you what is the highest point on these topographies? So don't think about the axial map as anything related to elevation. Similarly, don't think about the tangential map for anything related to elevation or height. Axial tells you vision, tangential tells you shape, curvature. The map that tells us the highest point is neither of these topographies. 
the red might indicate to you this is the most curved point in the topography. Well, that might be true, but it's not the highest point necessarily. It could be, but the axial map doesn't describe height, it describes vision. If we compare that to the same eye, same topography, and the tangential map, the steepest, most curved point is way out here in the periphery. So the tangential map is, in theory, telling us that this is the most curved point. So is that the highest point on the side? And the story is, neither of these maps will tell us what is the most elevated point on the eye. That's the elevation map. And what it does is in relationship to a best fit spherical surface, and this can all get very academic, but ultimately what you're doing with an elevation map is placing a spherical surface on this eye. Generally, you're going to try to align it or the software will align it with the peak of the cornea. And wherever that sphere indicates the eye is higher, than the elevation sphere, then you're going to see red. Wherever the eye is below the elevation sphere, you're going to see blue. So the elevation map is incredibly valuable because it tells you where is a contact lens going to hit the hardest? Where is it going to hit the least? And that's seen in, this, uh, in these images where you notice from the OCT, the corneal thickness, the yellow line is dropped on the eye as a perfect spherical surface. This is the best fit sphere. It's aligned in the center at the peak of the cornea. Where the best fit sphere, where that spherical reference surface would fall in or dig into the cornea, that's where you see the red on the elevation map. So the best fit sphere has fallen below the elevation of the cornea. That creates red. Where you see the blue, that's where the elevation sphere is above the corneal elevation. That's here and here, as you can see on this image at 12 and 6 o'clock. So elevation map is going to tell you about height and that is the real story in contact lenses. If we want to understand anything about a fitting of any contact lens, a soft lens, a scleral lens and everything in between, we need to understand height or sagittal depth. So if we take the same patient and place a rigid spherical corneal GP lens on eye, where do you think the contact lens will hit? And of course, you know intuitively that a rigid contact lens will always bear on the flattest meridian of the eye. So we could just go back to the K readings and look at the flat axis. The elevation map tells us that we have red at three and nine o'clock. And sure enough, when we use the Medmont contact lens software, we see the landing at nine o'clock, we see the landing at three o'clock. So that's where the eye is most elevated. If we go to the steep meridian, we take this white axis line, rotate it to the vertical where the tear film is the thickest. We notice how much fluid layer we get as we go north, how much fluid layer we get as we go south or inferior. Now remember that this cornea was about a four and a half diopter corneal astigmatism. So for those of you who think in millimeters, that's approximately 0.9 millimeters of corneal astigmatism. We have an incredibly toric eye. So it makes sense that if we were to place a spherical contact lens on an incredibly toric patient, we're going to get a mass amount of fluid underneath 12 and six o'clock. Just what the elevation map told us. So taking this high corneal astigmatism, placing it on this patient with this severe elevation change, we notice what happens with the spherical lens. It lands at three and nine o'clock, but of course it has nothing to align it across the vertical meridian. So the lens is going to rock back and forth. It's going to float around. It's not going to be very stable. So let's have a conversation about 
sagittal depth. Let's have a conversation about elevation and how we might approach eyes related to height. So here is about the simplest cornea that any of us are about to see, a absolutely normal symmetric eye shape. The K readings would suggest this patient has a tiny amount of astigmatism, 0.55 of a diopter corneal sill. For those of you who think in millimeters, that's 0.1 millimeters of corneal astigmatism. Let's ignore the K readings. Let's ignore what happens here at this three millimeter ring. Let's look at the peripheral corneal shape. That's where a rigid contact lens is going to come to bear on this cornea. It won't land at the apex. The, the peak of the cornea doesn't matter. The K readings really don't matter because we're not landing a lens at three millimeters diameter or 1.5 millimeters from center. What matters is where the lens lands and, and that's at eight, nine or 10 millimeters depending on the size of your rigid lens diameter. So let's measure sagittal depth. And of course, what is sagittal depth? That's taking a cord of contact across the cornea or for a scleral lens across the, um, the conjunctiva and the sclera, then measuring from that cord of measure to the peak of the eye. So Z is how high is the elevation of this patient? Now let's do that measurement across the flat meridian and across the steep meridian. This eye measures a height of 1,501 microns this way, 1,509 microns this way. Now who cares about these numbers? Why are they meaningful? Well, this patient has an eight micron difference between the height of the eye this way and the height of the eye this way. So why is the spherical cornea just so darn easy to fit with almost any contact lens? And that's because the elevation all the way around the clock is so symmetric. It's uh, a tight differential all the way around. So when you place a rigid contact lens on this patient, it's very likely to find good alignment all the way around. And any movement that exists might be due to that tiny, eight micron channel that exists along the steep meridian of the eye, the eight microns deeper that you are across the steep axis. Of course, lid force and gravity are gonna play a role, a big role in contact lens movement, but surely the eye shape does matter. Let's take another patient. Here we have a corneal astigmatism of near to one and a half diopters. So that would be about 0.28 millimeters of corneal astigmatism, a low corneal astigmat. Let's look at the sagittal depth of the flat, the sagittal depth of the steep, and what is the difference between those two values? So we'll just subtract them from each other. And this patient has 33 microns of difference between the height of the flat and the steep. Now remember that a con rigid contact lens will always bear across the flattest corneal meridian. Now why is that? Why the flat meridian of the eye? Why not the deepest meridian of the eye? And of course, it's because the flat meridian of the eye has the least sagittal depth. The corneal elevation in the periphery is the highest, whereas in the steep meridian, the elevation is the highest, but that's sagittal depth. The corneal surface is dropping backwards. It's dropping not up in elevation, but down toward the back of the eye. So the eye is 33 microns deeper running across the vertical meridian. And that's why your rigid contact lenses never bear across the steepest axis of the eye. It's the deepest axis. So if you put a symmetric lens on a toric eye, it's going to land on the flat. It's going to land where the elevation is the highest in the periphery, but the sagittal depth is the lowest. 
So if we place this contact lens on the patient, what do you expect to see? And of course, we expect to see landing at three and nine o'clock, which we have, and we expect to see a channel for the lens to freely move through the vertical meridian because the eye is deeper by 33 microns running vertically. And we get a pretty good contact lens fit. Now, could we reduce the movement and increase the comfort for this patient by uh, aligning a little better across the steep axis? And that's something that we're doing with greater frequency today with rigid contact lenses. 33 microns is a tiny amount of differential. This would be deemed an acceptable GP fit. But if we were to create a peripheral toric landing, could we improve the comfort even more by decreasing that slight vertical movement that you see here? Let's take a tougher case. Here's a patient with limbus to limbus corneal astigmatism. Notice the hot meridian runs from one side of the eye to the other. We have two and a half diopters of corneal astigmatism. So the central corneal astigmatism is a reasonable level, but look at the periphery. Your peripheral cornea also has tericity. So we have both the central corneal astigmat, but also a peripheral corneal astigmatism. Now, what if we were to measure the sagittal differential of this eye? Let's compare the flat, compare the steep, What's the difference between those two numbers? And we have an incredible 150, sorry, 115 microns differential in the height of the eye. Now, what does 115 mean to you? And generally in fluid thickness, bubbles can form at around 90 microns. So if you're 115 microns deeper running through this axis, you have an incredible amount of fluid underneath that cornea. Well, when we put that patient, that um, eye, um, into a rigid contact lens, of course, now we see a real severe amount of decentration and a very unstable contact lens that's tilting against the superior cornea. We have a lens that across the horizontal meridian is probably appropriate. It's clearing the corneal apex. It's landing at three and nine o'clock. We know that because the contact lens is laterally stable. Let's back that video up and start it again. Notice how the lateral movement of the contact lens is really minimal. That might indicate that we have good landing at three and nine o'clock but we have a totally inadequate, a totally, um, a completely inappropriate relationship of the alignment in the vertical meridian. So what does this patient require? Clearly a toric rigid contact lens. So when we look at the elevation map, we see that the height of the flat and steep, uh, sorry, the flat meridian is around plus 94, 95 microns. But when we go to the opposing meridian, we lose a lot of elevation between this point here and this point here, or this point here and this point here. So that's why the toric eye needs a kind of a stigmatic or toric rigid contact lens that 115 microns of difference between the flat meridian and steep meridian requires a contact lens with two totally different depths. So if we think about this eye as two different contact lenses, we're gonna build a specific sagittal depth this way, a completely different sagittal depth this way. And that's what we did here with this toric RGP lens. We have a appropriate landing across the horizontal, then we've created a completely different sagittal depth across the vertical. So we have a lens that wants to snap right back onto center, that wants to be relatively stable across the apex. The one consideration is lid force seems to be relatively strong, gravity probably playing its role in pulling the contact lens back on center. We could likely use more sagittal depth, go larger to decrease the amount of movement here and create a slight improvement in comfort. So using our topography data, 
both the sagittal depth and the, the visible iris diameter would help us to best choose the initial lens here. What about this eye? How do you use sagittal depth to understand this cornea? This is where things get really interesting. If we were to measure the, the what appears to be the flattest axis of the eye or we'll cut across this cornea to avoid hitting the cone and we're finding a sagittal depth of 1500 microns. When we go to the steepest axis, we're finding a 1582 micron height. When we go to this axis, 1549, and this axis, 1520. So what you understand about the irregular cornea is what makes it such a challenge is not the droopy apex. That might factor in there, surely. Um, it's not the, how steep the cornea is. It's that the eye is so asymmetric that we need to apply a lens that has that similar asymmetry. And we shouldn't expect a symmetric corneal GP to be able to manage this very asymmetric surface. Another consideration is the elevation. Let's pull up the elevation map. Look for the highest point. Look for the lowest point on the meridian of greatest elevation shift. And you can see from the map that we have the hottest curvature in this direction, the coldest curvature in this direction. When you take your white axis line across this meridian, you see this eye has a elevation shift from plus 112 microns down to around negative 146 microns. So there's a big shift in elevation. This eye has a 256 micron change in height. In the study that we shared back in 2015 by our group at Pacific University showed that when you have less than 350 microns of sagittal differential across the eye. So going back to this slide, we look at the highest point being 112, the lowest point being minus 146, for an absolute differential of 256, uh, sorry, 258 microns. Then we look at the study. When the elevation difference is less than 350, corneal GPs worked with great success. That's the red bars you see here. In fact, 88% of the time, the corneal GP could work when the elevation difference was under 350. The green bars that you see here, that's the scleral lenses where we were forced to fit a scleral lens because the patient couldn't be fit with corneal GP. Either we weren't able to get a decent relationship with the eye or the patient wasn't comfortable enough and we were forced to go with scleral. Now, when the elevation difference is over 350 microns, that's where you notice the red bars coming down we struggled to fit a corneal GP on these patients because the eye's asymmetry was so much higher. In this case, because we had 258 microns of elevation differential, we were able to fit a corneal GP with great success, and this patient was quite happy with the outcome. If the elevation difference were over 350, then we might not be surprised if this patient required a scleral lens fit. So some of the considerations that we've discussed that you might consider um, is when you have greater than 30 microns of elevation difference between the flat and the steep meridian. In other words, when you have a toricity of peripheral cornea measured at 30 microns or greater, that's when you want to use a toric GP lens. Now, this is incredibly valuable related to orthokeratology lenses that need to center so well to provide the appropriate hydraulic forces centered to the pupil. 
So 30 microns or greater use a toric landing. And one of the nice things about the, the Medmont topographer is it gives us the sagittal depth very easily. There's an attribute that will um, show up on your main window that you can quickly look at. So actually the first thing that I look at when I look at a corneal topography related to a rigid fit is not the K readings, is the sag differential. Do I think I need a torque or a symmetric landing? Now another consideration is related to corneal GPs versus scleral on the irregular cornea. How often do we need a corneal GP? How often do we need a scleral? When is that point that we should think immediately scleral lenses, that this eye is clearly over the threshold? And that's to find the most elevated point and the least elevated point along the same axes. And when that differential in height is greater than 350 microns, you are thinking scleral lens as the lens of first choice. Now, of course, if the patient has an incredibly deep set eye, or if you would expect that handling application and removal is going to be a problem for the patient to manage because they're a first time contact lens wearer, then of course, try a corneal GP. But use this 350 microns as a guide to direct where the decision making may be the best. What is the likely lens of first choice going to be? So related to the scleral story and our Medmont topographer, how do we use this instrument for scleral lens fittings? And one of the valuable findings that uh, came from Pacific University was to understand the angle that begins to form in the peripheral cornea that generally runs through the limbus and onto the sclera till about 20 millimeters diameter across the eye. So 20 millimeters across the sclera. And this straight line or tangent shape is really seen in this image. Notice how the cornea, of course, is curved. But as you reach the peripheral cornea, the limbus and the sclera, it really is like a straight line surface. So if we can measure this angle that begins to form in the peripheral cornea, it's possible to measure the sagittal depth all the way to the point of bearing of our soft lenses or our scleral lenses. So what do we need from the corneal topographer that would help us to understand the depth that we need of our first diagnostic lens. The corneal sagittal depth is one of two things you need. We have to, of course, understand how high the cornea is. The second component is the scleral angle. Um, and that scleral angle generally runs into the peripheral cornea. If our topographer can measure this angle at 10 millimeters and some of the data points toward the peripheral cornea, we can predict the height of virtually any eye. So using the Medmont composite topography, and this is a feature of the Medmont that allows you to take different fixations and build 100% of the cornea. This to me is one of Medmont's most valuable functions because it allows me to get 100% of corneal coverage. What you basically do is have the patient fixate down the axis of the instrument, you take a central image. Have the patient fixate one, two, three, four rings, usually four rings is optimal, toward the nose, and that will push the placido to the temporal side. Have the patient fixate four rings toward the temporal side, and that'll push the placido far to the nasal side. Have the patient fixate down, that pushes the rings to the top. Have the patient look up, that pushes the rings to the bottom. So now you have a photo with those rings reflected all over the peripheral cornea. You can construct the topography, the eye shape, um, over the entire cornea. And then when you do the composite capture, what it's going to do is it'll merge all of those topographies together to create a much larger view of the eye. 
The MedMont takes an incredibly big area of data. As a small cone topographer, it automatically gives you a large surface area of capture. Um, but with the composite feature, you can get even larger an area of analysis. So related to large diameter rigid lenses, related to scleral lenses, this is the tool that you want to use with every one of your captures. Now, when we go to the attribute window with our composite topography, we can go over to these EH chord attributes. Now, what is this describing? The EH is estimated height. It is calculating or estimating the height of the anterior chamber past the point of measure. So it's going to use the peripheral angle that it can measure here on these data points to estimate the height of this eye. So I'm using a 16.5 diameter ICD lens that lands at a 15 millimeter cord. Its sagittal depth is measured to a 15 millimeter cord. So what we want to do then is understand what is the height of the eye in relationship to the lens I want to pull from my diagnostic set. And in this case, it's saying that the flat meridian, the 0, 180 meridian, has an estimated height of 3,707 microns. It's saying that the 30 to 10 axis is almost 4,000 microns. So I wouldn't be surprised if I put a lens on eye and I slightly underestimated the height of the eye because there is a differential in elevation depending on the axis that we're looking for. So we're going to do a really simple formula. We'll take the estimated height from the MedMon. We're going to add the fluid layer that we want on application of the lens. 37 plus the 400 microns tells us we need a 4100 micron lens. So then we go to our diagnostic set and we place that contact lens on eye and we um, hopefully have the ideal first lens. So this tool is used to help you design the or to choose the initial scleral lens that you might pull out of your diagnostic set. Now, we didn't talk at all about the contact lens software, or we really touched on it very little. Really, this is one of those areas that if you have a MedMont, you want to learn a little bit more about it. We at Pacific University use the contact lens software to fit 100% of our corneal GPs. We want to model the fitting of the lens in this theoretical environment before we place the lens on eye. We want to verify that we're happy with the appearance or fit of the lens here in the software rather than waste time cleaning the contact lens, placing it on eye, letting it equilibrate, finding out that the lens needs to be modified wasting chair time, wasting patient time, we use the contact lens software to find the best lens first. So that's something you really want to spend a little bit of time to learn about and that in your MedMon is going to be something that will be of great value. Um, I'm going to end the session by saying thanks to all of you for, for coming in and joining us for this uh, session. I'm going to pass it over to Chris, and he has a bit more information about the upcoming session. So thanks, everybody. And uh, Chris, could I pass it back to you? And thanks for setting up this session, Chris. We appreciate it. Thanks, Randy. Sincerely appreciate your time on this uh, webinar. I uh, look forward to the uh, next one that you're going to be doing for us as well, too. I'd also like to say thanks again to our co-sponsors, um, NIDEC USA, iVinci from the Netherlands, Number 7 from the UK, Medcornia from Russia, Supervision Soflex from um, Israel, Belgian Optical from Belgium, Conlens from Denmark, and Belosa from Austria. I also rest, uh, suggest that you reach out to your Medmont distributor, of who I mentioned as well too, and ask them for a virtual demo if you're interested in learning more about the MedMont. Also, if you're interested about pricing, we are offering some special pricing, which I guarantee you will never 
uh, get uh, this type of pricing again for this particular series of webinars that we're doing. Thanks again for your time, and I sincerely hope to see you on our next webinar.